to start the meeting. First of all, welcome everyone to our February 2021 meeting of the Native Prairies Association of Texas Houston chapter. Uh, glad you all could make it. Our presenter is Andy Newman. He's ecologist and project manager at Cox McLean Environmental Consultants in Houston. And the title of his presentation is East Texas Field Botanizing, how to use publicly available data to aid in plant identification and community classification. Uh, Mr. Newman is going to present in two parts. He's going to be talking about the various information that's available. And uh, public also means free, I think in almost every case. Uh, and then uh, if you have questions as he proceeds, uh, go ahead and put those into the chat function. Uh, when he reaches the end of that first half, he will then address your chat questions. And after that, proceed to the second part uh, on specific habitats at Houston Wilderness Park uh, to show you how the technical information is applied. And uh, this will empower you to uh, identify local flora, to be prepared in advance for what is likely to be there and use of the initial data layers and classifying the vegetation communities. And um, that'll get you ready to go out and explore East Texas. I've been out there myself on a couple of butterfly expeditions with the North American Butterfly Association. And it's really worth your while to, uh, to be prepared in advance because there's a lot of interesting things to see there. And uh, having technical information uh, at your command will certainly enhance your experience. So without uh, further intro, uh, let me yield the floor to Mr. Newman so you can proceed. All right, share the screen real fast. All right, so we'll get started. Yeah, like Wally said, it's kind of, this thing breaks up in two parts pretty well. And so I think that we'll go through it like that. And let me hide this real fast. And yeah, so if you all have questions as we go along, uh, feel free to ask. You know, I'm a, I've been working in the environmental field uh, about 13 years now. I started off, kind of a little bit about me, I started off wanting to be a waterfowl ecologist and I really like birds and that didn't pan out quite so much. Uh, it's a really competitive field and I ended up getting more into plants and wetlands and streams uh, and kind of part of my job title is to go into different areas and and try to classify what's there and this is some of the information that kind of as I've learned to do this uh, found very helpful and Part of it is I just, uh, I, I like to do this on the side too. So I've taken several fun trips just for myself, collecting trips into Florida and Appalachians and South uh, California, and hopefully in the future, uh, do some stuff up in the Rocky Mountains and some other areas. But yeah, so I'm gonna go through this and you know, most of this information is publicly available. Some of it, um, can be easily transitioned into a platform like Google Earth. And then some of it is a little more intensive um, geospatial data or GIS data that normally requires a little bit more advanced platform like uh, ArcGIS. So it might not be quite as easy to utilize. And then several of these platforms actually have online viewers. So I'll try to call out um, those various ones so going forward, <clears throat> kind of the why behind this talk, or I think what is really helpful is, you know, for the most part, you know, animals and plants, you know, very much um, normally have predictable areas that they like to inhabit. And I think because of that kind of predictability or, or fractal patterns, you know, across a, across a landscape, it allows you to, you know, more effectively kind of communicate or kind of, uh, go and look at these areas. And really, I think the whole point of this is kind of how to 
you know, do some, some cursory homework on the front end to really maximize your time outside. And, you know, for me, I'm just a big nerd. I like to see as much as I can uh, every day. And so I try to go to as varied of habitats as possible. And really, you know, I, I think that it's just, this is somewhat an ecology talk, but to kind of give you all, you know, a baseline of where to start gathering some of this, some of this information is, you know, it's just, it's merely an, a relationship between, you know, living organisms. In this case, we'll be focusing mostly on plants, but obviously, you know, fungi interact with plants, they break down, you know, woody debris, and then obviously animals live within, you know, plant communities. And the living organisms interacting with, you know, abiotic or non-living things, you know, the elements, you know, wind, water, fire, the soils, climate, and then, you know, I don't, we won't cover too much in this evolutionary front. Um, that's, that's a whole different talk right there. It's a lot of fun, but um, really at the, at the end, I hope that I give you all some ideas of maybe how to go out and enjoy your time more in nature and, and maybe be more productive and find some interesting things to see and maybe help identify some of these. Um, I'll focus a little bit on rare habitats today, but maybe helps find some, you know, rare habitats or rare populations of plants that, you know, science didn't know existed. So I call this part doing your homework, you know, doing your area homework. Um, you know, like I said, most of this data is available and most, it's pretty easy to search. So I'll kind of walk you through these data sets and how I utilize them. So just really fast, um, we won't cover this. We're gonna kind of just use this as a running trend. I've started doing a little bit more um, botanical um, collection out of Lake Houston Wilderness Park. I don't know if y'all have been there or not, but it's, it's a nice park. It's about 5,000 acres in New Caney. Um, it was originally you know, a timber company property that Texas Parks and Wildlife, I think in the 80s from the timber company and then in 2006, it was transferred to the city of Houston. And, you know, it's got some pretty nice uh, trails on it, as well as it also has camping and cabins, which, you know, right now with COVID, I'm not sure if they're open or not, but, you know, it's, it's up 59. So it's, you know, northeast of Houston proper. And it's kind of the Caney Creek kind of forms the western boundary and East Fork San Jacinto River forms the the eastern boundary, oh, it's Cane Creek forms the western boundary, and it kind of is the headwaters of Lake Houston. So the first one is aerial imagery, and I'm sure, you know, y'all use Google Maps and other things all the time. You know, this is, you know, a really common one to utilize, and I think it's, it provides a lot of information, and, you know, we'll walk through time, but, you know, normally, if you're searching on Google Earth or Google Maps, the first thing it's gonna do is pull up the most recent aerial image. Um, and this is great because it kind of gives you a good starting point to you know, roughly look at your area. And so let's just take you know, Lake Houston Wilderness here. You know, because it's bounded on two sides um, by some pretty major, you know, major river and a major creek, it kind of shows that there's only one access point, which is to the north. And, you know, trying to, you know, learn where your, you know, ingress, egress points are into a property is, is pretty important in terms of both, you know, accessing the property, but also for safety. And actually, this one is an older image, but they're actually building the next segment to the Grand Parkway, you know, immediately north of this property. But then from, a, you know, from an ecological or plant perspective, you know, I kind of look at broad strokes starting off. And, you know, when I look at this picture, and I think Bob said this will be published. So if y'all want to ever go back and spend more time with these photos, uh, you can do so. You know, I'm seeing two different colors of green in this one. There's, there's a really deep green, and there's kind of this uh, a little bit lighter green. And it, you can see how they're kind of fuzzy in there, and there's a lot of blending of boundaries. And I think as we kind of go through this, you'll see why there's probably more of that blending, especially when you kind of get to the southern portion of this property. But normally when I see a dark green like this in East Texas, it's probably pine. A lot of times, especially if you're going through photos and different times of year and you're finding stuff in the you know fall, winter time, early spring, if it's lighter, it's normally deciduous, more dominated by deciduous trees and pine, you know, since they're always holding on to their needles. Um, you know, they're always going to be a pretty dark green. 
Um, and then other things I look for beyond just a, a broad stroke is, you know, I look for any kind of infrastructure. Yourself. And so there's a couple of things I see here. It looks like there's a road system kind of in the northwest corner of, of the property. I see two distinctive pipelines. There's one that running north-south and one running east-west. And those are sometimes really good access points into, you know, kind of areas deeper into a property if there's not good roadway or, or trail access. I also look for any presence of water. Um, and here I don't see anything uh, too pressing. And then I also look for kind of any kind of anomalous um, habitats, which here there's not too many that I can see just, you know, naked eye, but there is a couple of dots there kind of in the northern part of this property that don't appear to have tree cover. So, you know, as I would scroll in and out of an aerial, I would be pretty curious about what was going on there. And I've been here, so I know what's going on and we'll get to that. And then, then with aerial, I normally try to go back in time as far as I can. And unfortunately, most of this property does not have an image from 1944 but the surrounding area does. And so you can see you know, how sparsely populated it was at that time. And it looks like there's a decent amount of tree cover in the surrounding area, especially associated with, you know, more of the major drainages. But as you kind of get away from the, the major, you know, riverine stream systems, it looks like it's a lot more sparse. And I think that that's one thing to note, especially in East Texas, um, is probably, it was probably a lot more savanna open historically just due to, you know, lightning started fires. So it's something to note. And so that's a good, kind of give us an idea. So as we go forward in time, you know, this is 1989, was under Texas Parks and Wildlife ownership, you know, pretty similar to what we saw on the, the most up-to-date um, aerial photography. It looks to be pretty forested, but we can see quite a bit more development around there. And so something like a fire creating more Savannah-like habitat is probably not nearly as likely now because of, you know, just fire suppression within an area and just the, the unlikelihood of, you know, a lightning strike within 5,000 acres. Uh, just really fast, since this is a prairie group, I did want to highlight one um, pretty unique situation I see quite a bit around Houston, and it's adaphic prairies or basically soil maintained prairies where there is something in the soil, whether that be salinity or whether it be there is a clay layer very, very high up in the soil strata. Something that's driving, you know, basically no encroachment from woody species. So this is actually from a property I used to manage when I was with uh, Harris County Flood Control District. This is Greens Bayou Wetlands Mitigation Bank. But you can see here where the stars at and kind of those surrounding pockets, there's no trees. And I've dug in this area, so I know what's kind of here is you have a very thin sandy loam, about 10 inches deep, and then a really dense clay layer underneath that. And it doesn't really allow for, you know, it doesn't have a good rooting media for trees and larger woody species, but it also is really prone to um, cycles of very, very wet especially in winter and early springtime and very, very droughty um, once you hit late you know, spring into early fall. And so um, oftentimes in terms of this area, in terms of on the, the Lissy formation especially, this is where a lot of the pretty uncommon to rare species of plants would occur because there's oftentimes quite a bit of interactions in these areas to create what's called saline barrens, which is where the species like Texas prairie dawn, which is restricted to a couple counties in Texas, occurs. And it's basically, it's such a harsh environment that, you know, a lot of these little um, annuals have learned to grow there and they basically don't have any competition from anything else just because of how unique of a kind of an ecological niche it is. So it's something to look for. And then if you actually look to the bottom of this one in the, in the bottom left corner, that area also doesn't have trees. It's a whole different situation. That's a flatwoods pond. These are normally really deep inundated wetlands that are mostly dominated by herbaceous vegetation and they hardly ever dry up. And they're, they're pretty neat in and amongst themselves, but they're almost like these bowls amongst the mostly pines and the water drains to them and really never leaves 
and they get normally very acidic and they have some pretty unique species that grow out there like some of the what is it lax leaf yellow dyed grass and hairy water pin primrose and maiden cane and warty sedge so it's pretty neat that's kind of a good picture of two of the unique habitats that don't get very um, dominated by trees and shrubs that are within this area and as you go further into east texas like into Tyler County, Hardin County, kind of a big thicket area in north. You know, these, especially the flatwoods ponds, oftentimes have um, really acidic species around the edges like uh, sundews, pitcher plants, more species of yellow eyed grasses, pipewort. So they're, they get pretty, pretty interesting once you go further, further east. So I'll kind of walk through some of these things that these variables that are available. So this is a um, you know, this is a geologic formation of Texas layer. It's I think available through the University of Texas. And I will say going forward, some of these layers are in shape files, so they're they're mostly for use in you know a GIS component. Um, like ArcGIS, but the great thing about shapefiles is you can actually import those into Google Earth and convert them into either KMZ or KML format. And if you just do a quick Google search, it'll show you how to do that. But shapefiles normally have five or six files associated with them, but there's a .shp file that if you just drag that into Google Earth, it will convert that for you to where you can actually use that in you know, Google Earth, which is a free program and it's, it's pretty useful. And really, some of you probably saw a talk of this recently, you know, I love geology because it is one of the biggest explanatory variables, I think in helping predict um, plant distribution patterns. It has a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of the baseline of, you know, what might the soil be? And also, you know, if it's a younger versus an older formation and how it got there in terms of how it was depositive, um, it, it's probably going to give you a pretty good idea of is it relatively flat or is it older and it has quite a bit more weathering, you know, via water or wind and it's got a lot more dissection. So it's going to be a lot more, you know, rolly hills oftentimes or, you know, you get into the more montane regions of, of the nation or the world for that matter. And it's going to be a lot more, you know, steep mountainous terrain. And, you know, really, um, I think especially when you think about East Texas is East Texas is, was basically a battle between the oceans and the rivers. You know, the rivers pushed out with, you know, sediment laden waters, <clears throat> especially during periods of when there was a lot of the water locked up in ice caps. This is, you know, recent stuff like the Pleistocene versus, you know, uh, when the water came off the ice caps and filled the land with more, you know, salt water and lagoonal systems. Um, it really impacts a lot of times um, soil components. So oftentimes the ocean depositive or the lagoon positive soils are gonna be oftentimes higher in clay content versus stuff that was dropped off by rivers or deltas, oftentimes has a lot more of a sand component to it. So kind of digging into, oh, real fast, we won't really cover this that much, but you know, it's from a higher level picture, <clears throat> you can kind of see um, maybe some of the features that um, impact, you know, local geologies. And I just throw this in there because anytime you see stuff like on the left-hand picture, like the, the, the um, Llano Uplift in Central Texas, which is the hill country, or the Mississippi Embayment, Appalachian Mountains, Peninsular Arc in Florida, oftentimes areas that were above sea levels for a lot longer. Have some pretty interesting um, floras and you know vegetation associated with them um, just because oftentimes they were separated from other parts of um, the landforms and so they were disjunct or had you know a lot of time to uh, be separated genetically and oftentimes they result in different species just because of that isolation and then the right hand picture just kind of shows, you know, there's the Rockies and the Plains. And that's kind of where a lot of the sediment in Texas came from is, you know, in terms of when the land was building, you know, towards the Gulf of Mexico. So we won't cover that too much, but, you know, this is kind of where it's fun to geek out on geology to see how it interacts with, 
we know what you actually see out in terms of plant distributional patterns. And just briefly, you know, basically geology is, is stacked, is that, you know, the older geology is underneath the younger geology and, you know, it almost, you know, all geology kind of forms these predictable patterns of stacking. And a great book that you can pick up on Google for normally $20, $25 is The Geology of Texas, volume one, which is stratigraphy or basically how and it covers the entire state, how all the geology of Texas was um, positive and it's got pretty neat stuff about, you know, some of the, you know, plants found in fossil records or, you know, different, you know, invertebrate or mammalian species. So it's a really good book. It's a great reference. And I think it, you know, kind of as I've seen more, it kind of helps me get a good idea before I even go to a part of the state of, you know, potentially what to expect to see there based on a geologic standpoint. And so kind of going with our example here, you know, there's three main geologic formations um, on this property, the oldest of which is the Lissy formation, which all these formations in terms of geology are, are very young. Um, and the Lissy is a really dominant um, formation in Harris County region. It's normally about the northern half of Harris County is on the Lissy formation and especially from a prairie standpoint, like the Katy Prairie is, is, was on the Lissy soils. And it's, it's, it's youngly deposited, it's you know about 100,000 years old and it was thought to be de deposited kind of when sea levels were about 100 foot higher than what they currently are. So they think it was deposited kind of more in a, uh, like a deltic standpoint in terms of, uh, you know, these, you know, large rivers kind of running into, you know, pretty shallow seas. And for the most part, the Lissy has, you know, anywhere from 12 to 36 inches of a sandy loam over top of a marine clay. Um, and then, you know, since it's so young, it has been worked over by wind and water, but it's not too much. So it's, it's pretty flat, but in terms of that kind of reworking of you, if you will, of the original deposit of material, for the most part, it's formed, you know, sandy mounds or ridges that you know, they're normally a foot to three or four foot taller than kind of the surrounding areas. Um, and one of the, you know, iconic features of, of this, this formation and kind of the, the Katy Prairie and some of the prairies around here, and even into the Flatwoods areas kind of north of the prairies are these things called Nema Mounds. And there's a lot of hypotheses around Nema Mound creation, but probably were something to do with, you know, windblown, um, sediments, heavy sediments kind of being trapped with probably on, you know, larger brush or bushes. And then the last two formations are really, there's only one more name formation, which is the Deweyville formation, which it comprises a majority of the park kind of on the upper parts of the, the floodplains of the Caney and East Fork San Jacinto rivers. And, you know, the for the most part, this formation, and you see it a lot, especially in rivers like the Neches River system, so a couple of river systems over to the east, is it's thought to be, you know, the active floodplain when, you know, this part of Texas got a lot more rainfall than what we do currently. And I think that, you know, it was interesting as you see things over, you know, kind of time is, you know, this formation acted like an active floodplain during Hurricane Harvey, which, you know, that was the largest recorded rainfall, I, mean, I think, out in East Texas like, ever in the United States. But it gives you an idea, like, this whole area was acting like an active floodplain during that size event. So, you know, those types of events were what deposited this, this kind of formation over time. So it's interesting to think about, you know, what we thought was a monster rain event was probably an average rain event, you know, you know, 60,000 years ago, potentially, you know, probably during a warm period when it was, um, you know, during a kind of an interglacial period. And then, you know, right along kind of the, the light color yellow is what they call um, alluvium. It's really recent, you know, it's probably only 10,000 years old. It gets, you know, flooded all the time currently, but it kind of gives an idea. And as we go through with some of the other features is I kind of use this, especially when I kind of start understanding the geology of an area to know Lissy's probably going to be, uh, have these characteristics and these other formations are going to have 
other types of characteristics. Um, we won't spend too much time here. This just shows some of the sea level rises and falls relating to kind of when glacial periods were versus interglacial periods. And then I just real fast on the right hand side is, you know, coming into our kind of current epoch, um, the start of it, sea levels were probably 400 foot lower than what they are today. And as a result, you know, water just responds to slopes and it was sloping down to, you know, a lot lower elevation and it cut a lot deeper valley for itself. And as the water came up, you know, basically these valleys um, that were really deeply cut started filling with sediment. And it's what we see a lot in our floodplains in this part of Texas. So the next thing kind of going off of geology is soil types. And this data is through the soil web, the NRCS soil web. Um, historically, before the soil web was online, they basically had county level um, soil maps where you go and pull the, the actual written copy published by NRCS and say, well, I, I'm here and this is my soil type. And, and they're great. They have a ton of information in there. It shows you soil profiles of the different types of soils, the different composition of soils. A lot of times they have you know, descriptions of soil series to give you an idea of, you know, what crops grow there or, you know, what's the rainfall like. So there's a lot of information, but the nice thing is now that it's available online is that you can go and I think with the soil source, uh, survey, you can, you know, put up, you know, polygon, you know, basically draw the outline of the property you're interested in, generate soil reports, then you can go in depth into the different soil types and say, well, I have this, I have this type of soil. It gives you a lot of information. So I really like using these soil ones once I really kind of get familiar with the area. And you know, like we talked about, you know, soil is sourced from, you know, basically their original deposition of an area. And, you know, here we see kind of an example of, you know, this soil series, oop, go back real fast. I can't, this thing's hiding from me, but um, there's two main, um, soil types here, the Sorter and the Tarkington soils, and it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what might be there. And I think the one thing I'd point out on that Tarkington soil is there's that little A horizon up top. There's an E horizon below that, and oftentimes you see an E, that means it's a really sandy layer. Um, but, it, you know, I think as you kind of learn the different soil types, it really helps you kind of get an idea for what might be there. So if I was in maybe some areas, you know, kind of north of here, maybe around like Fairfield, Texas, where that's um, a lot older um, geologically, if I was looking at some soils and I saw like a ton of sand, that's where I would anticipate species like Texas sand mint and some of the other pretty unique species that grow in, you know, really deep sands to occur. And, you know, kind of going back to soil structure, a lot of times if it's a super sandy soil, you know, sand doesn't hold water very long and it infiltrates really rapidly. Versus a clay, you know, clay particles are so small that they basically don't let hardly any water through. And so um, really low permeability. And so a lot of times a heavy clay is gonna hold water for a long time. And then also, you know, I don't think the soil series does a great job of this, but um, just kind of starting to understand, you know, chemically, you know, what, how do different soil types, you know, provide bioavailability of, you know, nutrients. A lot of time nutrients are in um, unusable forms and, you know, it takes a lot of effort, especially plants interacting with, you know, below ground species of especially fungus, mycorrhizae to unlock those nutrients. So a lot of times, if you start kind of learning your area, you can get an idea of which soil types are, you know, more rich and produce, you know, really diverse or, you know, robust growth versus some soil types might have a lot more sparse growth just because of some type of, you know, inability to, you know, get nutrients or in really unique situations, um, especially this is like glade habitats or barrens is that it's very, very thin. It's normally like exposed to nearly exposed rock, very thin soils <coughs> that are going to um, probably produce some pretty unique situations where you might have some really rare plants in a, a great area. If y'all are ever in Alabama is the Dolomite glades or Gitona glades, kind of in the central part of the state. 
I think they had the highest recorded dolomite with manganese. There's a lot of really rare and unique plants that grow on those uh, super thin soils over basically exposed rock. And then briefly, um, you know, climate obviously is really important. The amount of rainfall, temperatures, all that's really important. And, you know, this link will be provided. Um, you can go over and look at it, but I like to use this and especially since I'm a wetland scientist, um, it kind of lets you tabulate this data, uh, but it's called these wets tables and you can, you can play with the data as much as you want. You can look at it really granularly at a you know, daily rate versus a yearly rate and kind of look at, and they have more than just water, but they have temperature and, and so, sometimes a couple other data is collected at each station, but it's a good idea um, to kind of look at your average rainfalls. And the great thing about some of the soils, like the soil web is a lot of times this information is already kind of in embedded within some of those, some of these larger file types or websites. And then I also like to look at uh, topographical maps and I normally try to go back as far as I can. Um, the great thing is USGS has all these digitized on topo view and you can go put a pin on where, whatever area you're interested in looking at and it will um, show you on normally the right hand column, um, starting with the oldest known uh, topographical maps for these areas. And oftentimes I really prefer these older ones. So anything from the 1910s to the 1930s are normally exceptional. And beyond the fact that it show elevations and creeks and some other things, they oftentimes, like when we get to the next slide, they also show canopy or potential canopy coverage from quite a long time ago. So, you know, 1920, that's over hundred years now. Uh, we can see that this area was green. So it, for the most part, had some tree cover. Now, the hard thing is it doesn't differentiate of, you know, is this a solid forest or was it more of a savanna type condition? But this part of Texas, um, you know, kind of north, you know, northeast of town, it probably was, you know, a savanna e type habitat with probably more of a traditional forest type along the major, you know, stream networks versus you get closer to town, um, and then I think this is, uh, so Umble is in the very uh, top right-hand corner. You see quite a bit of, you know, trees associated with, you know, cypress and spring creeks, but when you get south of there, it's all open. And, you know, that's, uh, this would have been historically, you know, the, the kind of the edge of probably the Katy Prairie and the Katy Prairie would have extended to the west from here. But yeah, these, these old topos are great in terms of, you know, seeing, um, and giving you an idea maybe historically what these areas would have been prior to large scale, you know, industrialization of Houston and Texas. And a lot of times these little depressional areas would have been prairie potholes or flatwoods ponds. But as you can see, like this aerial or this, you know, topo is, is pretty young. It doesn't really show um, much of anything outside of, you know, roadways, creeks but I really like those older uh, topographical maps a lot in terms of giving me an idea of, you know, maybe what was there and just topography of an area. This one, probably not gonna be super easy to use. I just wanna highlight it really fast. If you have the capability to use light detection ranging uh, data sets or LIDAR, they're amazing. Um, oftentimes these things can have accuracy of up to like one to six inches or at worst case scenario, a foot. Um, I'd say for the most part for plants and vegetation, this isn't really that important, but if you can get your hands on it and the ability to look at them, LIDAR is amazing. It's a basically um, a, a platform is flown over an area. It shoots out a bunch of lasers it takes returns on those distances from when the laser uh, was shot out and how fast it returned to get an idea of, you know, what the um, elevation was. And then you have to do ground truthing to, because obviously if it's shooting a bunch of lasers out, it's going to hit trees and bark and trunks. And um, so you have to correct to actually get the ground elevation. But you can see on the bottom picture, it'll actually show you the strata of the forest all the way to the, the you know, the floor with a soil top. So it's, it's amazing, it's amazing uh, da data you can garner, but it normally takes a lot more uh, skilled kind of utilization of the computer and 
in a post-processing and, and software. So it's probably not gonna be super friendly, but just wanted to point out if you ever get a chance to look at it, it's great. Uh, and this is why it's great. <clears throat> you can see a lot of clarity in terms of what's going on within this property is the darker the, darker the red, the higher the elevation versus the brighter the blue, the lower the elevation. So we can see we have a, a range of about 130 foot and some of those little ridges on the Lissy formation all the way down to about 40 foot along the, the two major drainages in this area. But what's so um, useful to um, these areas as you kind of get into some of these kind of areas of, of light blue, it kind of shows you old river channels and you can see all the snaky nature of all the kind of abandoned channels associated with you know, the, the active floodplains as well as the abandoned floodplains. And then you can also see kind of the orangey colors, they're kind of like little mounds. You know, those areas where when, they, when this area used to get more rainfall are probably like old abandoned, you know, stream levees or, or something associated with, with some kind of, you know, riverine type system. Um, and so if you have access to this data, it's great because, you know, I would expect you know, plants in the red to be probably quite a bit different than plants in some of these blue colors. And the blue colors are gonna kind of give you an idea of it's, those are natural kind of low gradient areas that are gonna probably provide a lot of flow and drainage to the area. So it kind of really helps you understand, you know, maybe how in terms of, you know, stream connectivity or, or how flooding would occur on a landscape, um, just kind of give you an idea and you know different species of plants have different you know mechanisms for dispersal and so stuff associated with the blue is probably going to use water you know moving flowing water and those in flood waters to transport seeds you know away from the parental plant downstream to you know new areas to colonize versus you know that red up there you can see there's a couple little fingers of, of um, yellow kind of bleeding into it and those are probably streams but for the most part that water probably just sits up there and takes it quite a bit of time to get to those um, yellow streams if at all. Um, really fast and I think this is important just in Houston to kind of know your floodplains but you know FEMA has mapped floodplains um, and just kind of the tie back into what we just said you know these areas probably get pretty predictable flow and so you're probably gonna have a you know, unique suite of plants associated with these floodplains. Uh, and then, you know, the eco region, um, you can, full, this is EPA did these, there's several different layers of e eco regions. This is, I think, eco region fours. Um, they're great, kind of, you know, there's different data sets we've talked about, but these are kind of just, this kind of pulls together a lot of information. This is pulling soil data, plant community data, and it kind of gives you a really good idea of um, what potentially might be within an area. Not super granular, but enough to kind of give you a starting point. And if I go to a brand new area, the first two maps I pull are geology maps and ecoregion maps. And it allows me to you know, really maximize my time if I'm trying to see as much you know, different unique cool things as possible to say, well, hey, there's this eco region and this one and this one, and they're all stacked together. And so if I take this line here, I'm gonna cross all of them. And it makes sense because there's this geology. So it's, it's really useful. And um, this one is one that kind of pulls together a lot of different data sets into one master data set. So you can learn a lot of information from these. Um, and just really fast, these are a little more granular. I don't think they provide as much data, but it kind of gives you an idea is the one on the left hand side is the National Hydrologic Data Set or NHD. It pretty much shows stream networks uh, within the United States. And then the one on the right is the National Wetland Inventory. And it kind of breaks out the different uh, potential wetland types. Um, and I think it's, it's a good kind of cursory um, tool to utilize that it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, this, you know, Lake Houston Wilderness has quite a bit of wetlands and it makes sense. I mean, you can see them here on the map. There's quite a bit of pink on that map. So there's probably quite a bit of wetlands uh, before you even go on a site, just to kind of give you an idea. And then lastly, before we'll, we'll stop here and take any questions that have accumulated is any other data sources that might be out there. Um, some of the ones I use are NatureServe, Explorer, 
that one is more of, you know, any kind of research done on, you know, different plant communities within a region. It has normally really good descriptions of plant communities, but you can also search for, you know, rare species, any kind of previously published data by, you know, botanists or ecologists or any kind of um, research within an area, like, you know, when you get into the deep East Texas and the Longleaf area, you know, Edwin Bridges and Steve Rizal has done a really great paper. And it's nice because it actually kind of breaks down quantitatively some of the, you know, more unique habitat types there and has really good species lists. So it kind of helps you not start from ground zero. It kind of gives you an idea of even from a fairly uncommon plant species, what might be there. And then anything like regional species lists, like, you know, Dr. Brown, for Houston put together a great one. That one's publicly available from Native Plant Society's website. So it really just kind of helps you not have to do as much legwork being like, I have a plant, I have no clue what it is. It can kind of give you an idea of, well, there's these, you know, 10 species to choose from in this area. So I will stop here for a second. I open the chat. All right, let's see. Why are there more clay deposits? Are there lagoons than river dip? Let's see, go back up. Yeah, the clay, I think, you know, so the lagoonal type stuff or, or shallow seas is a lot of times clay is a, a very fine, you know, particle. And it takes pretty much really calm water a lot of times to deposit out. So I think. A lot of times those finer deposits kind of get deposited out on in these lagoons or shallow seas just because they've finally lose the flow associated with, you know, the rivers draining the landscape. Link to soil maps, I can provide that. But if you just type in um, NRCS uh, soil web, that will bring that up. How deep are the saline flats was underneath? Uh, the saline flats normally have a clay underneath them. They're often very shallow in terms of green media. Most of the time, I think they're anywhere from six inches to maybe 14, 15 inches. Um, and they kind of form just, I think that the baseline soil would have had a, quite a bit of sodium in it. And then just kind of as the kind of hydrostatic pressure uh, between highs and lows and the topography kind of forced the salt into one area. Yeah, so I don't see too many more. So I'm gonna take a sip of water and then we can go on. So we won't spend a lot of time. I feel like this would be a whole different course in terms of like how to successfully identify plants in the field. But we'll go through it really rapidly is one note taking is crucial. I think, um, you know, having good GPS to take your location. And this is be more for like actually collecting plants is, you know, if you know the habitat type, if you know the dominant species within the area, that's always great to know. And I think for anybody, from a just identification standpoint from photos, if you don't know what a plant is, this is what I always tell people to get is one, give me a photo of the overall plants habit. Like, is it big, is it tall, is it droopy, is it erect, is it, you know, sprawly? You know, that kind of context of how it grows is really important to capture. And then start getting more close up pictures. Obviously, if it's got fruits or flowers, get, several pictures of it, you know, get it from the top, get it from the bottom, get it from the side. You know, those are all things that, you know, there might be certain little hairs on the, in the bottom of a flower that differentiate from one species to the other. You know, get a close up of the, of the leaves, you know, like both sides of the leaves and then certain species like on oaks, you know, try to as good as you can get really good pictures of the underside because a lot of times they're identified by different hair types in the bottom of the leaf. And then any other diagnostic features, is there certain plants that from a veg vegetative standpoint, so a non-reproductive uh, part of the plant, it might have something really unique like a spine or any kind of other structure. So if you see, you know, some of the, 
the, uh, the meadow or the meadow beauties, you know, they have these trichomes, these really cool like modified hairs on their stem. And so it's little features like that, that will help people, especially if you're asking someone else for assistance on identification, it might help them rapidly give you an answer on what you see. From a collection standpoint, um, you can press plants in the field, or what I normally do is I'll go out into one unique habitat, collect several plants, I'll throw them in a gallon bag, I'll put some notes in there in the bag, close the bag up. If I'm gonna be out for a, you know, a couple of days, what I'll do is I'll throw the bag for habitat type into you know, my cooler on ice, and they normally stay really good. And that way, instead of wasting my daylight, having to press plants in the field, now they might not be quite as pretty and some people get mad about that, but they can deal with it. Um, I can do a lot more data and that way I can process them in the nighttime at the campsite or when I get home. And especially when I'm in a new area and there's collecting a lot of sedges and grasses, it helps me to just take them home, pull them out, actually put them underneath a, you know, a stereoscope or a microscope, look at the characteristics I need to give it a name in terms of the species. Um, that really helps. And then lastly, you know, don't forget to smell the plant. Um, a lot of them have pretty unique smells and a lot of times you can get directly to a species uh, by smell. And then also I try to grab per area just kind of a snapshot of the habitat type just to kind of get an idea of what it looked like. And that's great for you know having presentations and whatnot just to get some good photos. Let's see. Um, identification, we always gloss rapidly over this. You know, for the most part, most plant, really good plant books um, utilize dichotomous keys in terms of like master kind of floras of an area. So like, you know, East Texas only has volume one done now, which is for the monocots. Um, but it's got pictures, but you pretty much have to know how to use these dichotomous keys. But there's a lot of resources now, especially for flowering plants that have really good pictures and it really helps. Um, from a photo standpoint, you know, stuff like INAT, the algorithm for identification is getting pretty amazing and it does a really good job. And I won't lie, I cheat all the time. If I'm in a new area, I don't know what something is, I'll use INAT and it, a lot of times on a flowering plant, it'll get really close or at least enough that like, I'm like, well, it's this, it's between these couple of things. And then I would say strongly, if you are using, you know, a you know, larger type flora book with the keys, sometimes you get stuck. And you'll be between two or three species and you're like, oh, what is this? I mean, they're, especially with some plants that maybe you grabbed at the wrong time of year and it's not quite mature. You're like, oh, I don't know. It could be any, it could be these three, but you go and look at this, the species description and say you collected it in a bright sunny prairie and two of the plants say, oh, this thing is found in bottomland hardwood forest under full shade. It's not going to be that plant. It's going to be the one that says grows in full sunlight on a sandy loam soil. And so I use that trick a lot, um, especially with some of the harder to identify plant groups to kind of weed out um, unlikely candidates in terms of just even where they would grow. Um, and then lastly, you know, range maps are another great resource. I use Bonap or Biota, Biota of North America. It's great, it stays a lot more up to date than like USDA has a plant database. It seems like that one takes a lot longer to update. But, you know, an example plant here would be Carolina water hyssop. And you can see, you know, it kind of is in the, you know, Atlantic Gulf Coastal Plain area. It's pretty rare inland. It's normally restricted to kind of right along the coast. So if you find it, you know, in North Texas, I mean, it's possible, but it's probably not super likely. So it really just kind of helps you, um, you know, maybe get an idea potentially of, you know, is a plant species probable or improbable in an area that you might be in. And I would say a big note is for a lot of these non-native species that have, you know, a kind of high level of the potentiality of being invasive, they can show up a lot of times almost anywhere. And so kind of, kind of the last part, putting it all together, kind of using our examples, we've, as we've kind of gone through and I've kind of highlighted each data layer, but like from a more holistic standpoint, this is kind of how I approach, um, and this is what I do for a living, Oh, but also what I do for when I want to go see a new area and just have fun. So number one, you know, we've, I've shown you all these different data sets. We've kind of talked how I use them, but now we're actually like, say this is the first time I ever was going to go out to um, Lake Houston Wilderness Park. 
you know, what would I, how would I want to approach this property? Say I had a day, you know, I'd say, well, I mean, I got this good LIDAR and you would be able to see this too on, on the topo, especially those older topos. So it's not like you have to have the LIDAR, but I, I'm kind of seeing three, three kind of distinctive areas here that, you know, there's probably some similarities, but there's probably quite, a, there's probably going to be some differences too. So I'm probably going to expect, you know, three broad categories of plants um, occurring here. So I got survey area one, two, and three. Um, and I think, you know, kind of going back to that geology map, I know that one is that lissy formation. So it's a little bit older, it's pretty flat. Knowing the area, you know, it's gonna, you know, probably not just pond water and not really have, you know, flooding type water going through it. Um, I can see it with these, you know, these really good LIDAR um, elevations. I've got quite a bit of, you know, elevation. It's not a lot, but if there's some micro topography, there's some depressions, and then there's some inside streams. And <clears throat> I think it's important to note those inside streams is there's definitely this very unique little group of plants that kind of have niches along kind of incised creeks in East Texas. A couple species of golden rods, a couple of species of uh, tick tree foils, some desmodiums, and it seems like, and there's some, a, lot, a lot of the violets kind of like to hang out in these areas. And there's, you know, they're awesome. They're going to be moss covered and lichen covered. They stay wet, they're cooler. So it's an area that I would definitely make it a point to try to get over to some of these streams and see if I had those plant species here because I you probably wouldn't find them anywhere else in the area. And then on the highest elevations, I would be like, well, there might be like white oak or maybe post oak or some other species that once it gets wetter, I, I wouldn't expect to see them. And so survey area two and three, similar, probably similar. They probably always have a little bit of flooding flows in them. Two's gonna probably be drier in terms of receiving water from the main creek systems versus three. It's probably gonna be flood, get flooded, you know, every year, every couple of years. And just be nice to know that. And then kind of, you know, as you develop that repertoire of knowledge um, yourself, you kind of know that these Deweyville areas, um, just kind of act differently in terms of their, they're kind of a transitional geology between active floodplains and normally higher elevations. Um, they're more prone to have seepage. Um, and so a lot of times with seepage, you might find stuff like if the uplands are more pine, it might be pretty acidic. So you might get some interesting carnivorous plants or orchids. So it's, it's good to know. And then three, you know, that's the active floodplains. And we talked a little bit about that, but you know, Big floods going to drive the plant community. They're probably going to stay wet via flood flows for a couple of weeks throughout the year. Um, and then plants like, you know, down there, I would expect certain species of the sedges, like uh, there's these, you know, different characters that have these huge, you know, basically flotation sacks around the seeds. And that, that's where they thrive in those wet areas down there, just because they use, they use the floodwaters to basically put their babies away from them so they don't have to compete with their, their progeny. So before I even step foot on the property, that's kind of what I'd be thinking is like, well, these are some unique areas. I, I would want to make sure I go look at these areas because I, I probably want to find different plants, you know, in those habitat types. And so that first site visit, you know, we kind of talked about kind of the why. And, and you know, really it's, covering as many elevations, you know, hydrologic or water regimes as you can and soil types, you know, and so like the first site visit, you know, before I would even get into this kind of next step is if possible, if I have time, I kind of like, especially if it's a big site and I have access to an ATV or UTV or, or it has good truck access, I'll just try to drive the area as much as I can just to kind of feel it in terms of where is the topography, what's the main plants, like just to get a feel for it. You know, is there a disturbance regime? Does it have fire? Is it not had fire for a long time? Does it have a lot of clearing? Um, any kind of, you know, is it super heavily grazed? I mean, all the things that might impact what plants you would expect to see. And then kind of getting into it, um, you know, once I kind of get a feel for the property beyond kind of this baseline, you know, computer work, you know, computer homework, um, that's when I'd start as much as I could to start kind of documenting like, okay, I think there's five main habitat types here. What's the main, you know, trees? What's the main, you know, grasses and sedges? And what's the main shrubs? 
and then you can get as fine as, as detailed as you want and really um, classify down your heart's delight. You can set up transects and do fully, you know, quantitative sampling to where you can successfully say there's 35% you know, cover of water oak and 15% cover of water hickory. And so I think it depends on, you know, your level of effort. And I think most people aren't going to put that much into it, but it's good to know. And then if you really want to take this in terms of, you know, producing products for either like scientific papers or presentations or really, to, you know, truly categorize an area. That's kind of where I start using, you know, field collected GPS points to say, well, here's my, here's kind of my line to say, well, this is community type A and it's community type B. You start hitting enough GPS points along those lines and saying, well, this is this transitional zone. It really helps you kind of get an idea of, you know, once you start turning those into polygons where you can, you know, or basically, you know, figures where you can trace an area, you can get an idea of, you know, this, you know, this property has, you know, you know, 30% of this wetland type and 15 of this and, you know, 25% of this upland community. And then also uh, hopefully through the research process before you get on a site, you might have identified any kind of anomalous soils or geologies that might support rare plants. And the reason I point that out is, you know, these are, you know, oftentimes species of conservation concern. Um, they, because they grow in more unique situations, um, they're more prone to extinction or really be threatened. Uh, oftentimes they don't have the greatest genetic linkages between other populations. So if possible, I do try to focus on those areas one, because oftentimes they have really cool plants, but the other is just, uh, you know, they are unique. And so a lot of times, you know, you'll see some stuff that no one else will get to see or not many people get to. And so kind of going, you know, once once I get done with that first, you know, site visit, um, we kind of talked about how you, how you utilize that is a lot of times, you know, I kind of have a, a broad, you know, paintbrush stroke on that first trip. I won't do any kind of, you know, intensive survey for the most part on that trip. But if I want to really be into an area and really try to get good documentation of what's there, I'll use that to start honing my search engine or, or where I want to go spend more effort within an area. And I think the biggest thing, one of the other things to emphasize is time of year is, you know, if you go in springtime, that's, you know, a mere snapshot of one year that, you know, maybe that year is super wet. And so you're going to get a whole, you know, you might get some other different types of plants pop up versus say you go in the first part of fall and it's, we've been in like 2011 drought. I mean, most things are probably going to be dead. And so it's a snapshot in time and to really kind of really, really get to know an area it's probably going to take multiple trips across multiple different seasons to really get an idea of, of what's growing there, kind of that change over time. And I think it's really important if you really want to do more intensive type surveys or understanding of an area to, to be able to go back and visit it several different times. Um, and we talked kind of to bring it all together is, you know, um, this property, just from a broad standpoint, it's got two main habitat types. It's got what I call flatwoods which probably was, I kind of view it as, it's a transitional habitat almost between more of the, the deeper forest of East Texas and, and the prairie on the coast. Um, I think historically there's probably been a lot more savanna -y types. So you probably would have had a lot more gaps in the canopy. Uh, we talked about topography. It's got a little bit of topography in it, uh, but you know, normally, you know, these areas just kind of pond water for quite a bit of time. They're not really connected to floodplains. And so, that Lissy formation and even part of the Deweyville formation is very much flat wood. So kind of these closed ponded systems that don't really have a lot of, of influence from you know, river systems. And so that's probably gonna support one different type of, of, of vegetation. And so you can kind of see here, there are some flat woods in the Lissy formation, but the Deweyville, especially the older part, you know, closed systems, you can see here in these photos, it was taken and I think, it's, we're taking in, I want to take these, February or March. So stuff is starting to green up. Um, but for the most part, you know, that, north, that top picture uh, versus the bottom one, you can kind of see there along the trees in the bottom one, there's you know, wood and, and leaves stacked up against the base of that tree. So that's a, that's a drift deposit. 
it's a really good indicator that there's enough flowing water within the landscape to pick up and move um, different organic material, you know, like leaves and twigs and, you know, heavy flow to pick up huge objects and move them. Versus the top picture, I don't see any drift deposits. It's kind of a closed system. Um, and I think for the top picture, you can kind of see how open it is. I think because it stays wet, uh, just doesn't have nearly as dense of understory versus if you kind of look in the background of that top picture, it's really thick, that's yopon. It's yopon growing on a sandy ridge. And that's a really common thing in this area to see yopon um, dominating the understories in upland areas. And flatwoods hydrology, we've already kind of discussed this. It's seasonally wet, um, for the most part, direct precipitation or overland flow, you know, no connectivity really to floodplains for the most part. Um, and then it has, you know, basically a clay layer underneath, kind of more sandy loams that really keeps water from um, being infiltrated into the groundwater. And, you know, water for the most part in these areas is lost via transpiration. So plants uptaking the water and then through their stomata, basically the opening in their leaves that help them regulate water, uh, releasing that, that water back into the atmosphere. We'll skip this slide. Flatwoods vegetation, I'd say there's two main types and you'll see them in different areas. Um, I think this way, uh, closer to Houston, it's a lot of times more mixed deciduous uh, with a little bit of pine versus you start getting into the, the further east towards the Sabine River and it, a lot of times you get very heavily pine, um, oftentimes long, or long leaf pine out there. Um, and I think that the pine's really important because I think pine drives the, hydro, or the pH, um, higher pine, uh, those needles are really high in acidity and it kind of, uh, I think it forms a cycle to where it becomes um, very nutrient poor and also very acidic and stays wet for a long time. Um, those types of conditions result in really poor nutrient availability and that's where you get stuff like pitcher plants, a lot more carnivorous plants. They're trying to um, import nutrients from outside in terms of um, capturing insects and other types of organisms. Uh, but for the most part, uh, when you're away from the pines, uh, these systems are often very much oak and elm dominated. Sugarberry will be in there, uh, water hickory, and then a lot of times in the more deciduous systems, uh, dwarf palmetto will be by far the most common kind of understory, you know, woody-esque species with quite a time, quite a bit of hollies, dogwoods, swamp privets, and then hawthorns. And then, so this is kind of like a weird transitional area. Um, it's kind of an old, old stream system that's kind of on the edge of the active floodplain and the Deweyville formation. But you can kind of see here that there is kind of a gradient kind of along that old abandoned channel where the middle part, which would have been historically the deepest part of the channel stays wetter quite a bit more than kind of the edges, which at this point um, during this rainfall event um, are just saturated versus actually having standing water. And then also, you know, it's one thing to note is like, I was looking out here in this patch of, you know, kind of flatwoods and I was like, man, why is, why are there these like circles? Because they're almost, they're uniform and almost the same size. And pretty sure this is correct, but I think that they were a bunch of old wind thrown trees where, you know, the entire root ball was, you know, thrown out of the ground by, you know, either hurricane, tornado, and now they form these little kind of pools within the uh, kind of flatwoods wetland here. So I think it's interesting to note stuff like that just from a, a nerd perspective. And then, you know, the last one was that habitat type three. This would have been the, the vegetation right along Caney Creek and uh, East Fork San Jacinto River. Um, these areas are largely, the vegetation is largely dictated by flood events and flooding depths and flooding durations. As a result, they oftentimes have quite a bit of vegetation banding where certain species are going to be right along the river versus species that are going to be in more flats. And then there's oftentimes dips in these floodplains, which is where you get really, really wet conditions that, you know, they fill with floodwaters and they stay flooded for pretty much the full year. And that's where you get like cypress and water tupelo, mayhaw versus, you know, these flat conditions that 
you know, they get flooding for, you know, maybe a week, maybe two weeks to a foot, three or four or five foot. That's where you get a lot more of your oak dominance, um, over cup oak, nut alls oak. And then right along the river system, it's, it's a high energy system, a lot of sand deposition. That's where you get species like sycamore, cottonwood, black willow, river birch. There's not many species that can hang out right next to especially major rivers just because they're so violent from a, you know, a water erosion, ero like erosive potential. Um, and they have to colonize sand, which is really hard to colonize. And then they stay flooded for a long time. So not many, not many species that hang out in those sandy levees um, associated with East Texas rivers. Um, and then you get stuff like this. This is actually Lake Isabel. So if you get a chance, there's a road that runs down here. It's really pretty. Um, it actually, it's hard to see in this photo, but it's a nice cypress ponded area. It's in one of those old abandoned channels. There's actually a levee that runs on the, the south side of the property, which is why there's ponding here. I think historically it wouldn't have been this way, but the, I think the levee was put up in the early 1900s to where you had the cypress come in there. So again, if you can get the LIDAR data, it can tell you a lot of information. And then here, you know, you can see that really with the little, little stars that you can see that kind of transition from, from a pretty bright yellow to a very, very blue, blue. And you can kind of see in the, the top picture, that's a, a Honda UTV up there. That's about a 25 foot drop. So that's kind of where if you have good, you know, topographic or elevational data, you can kind of get an idea of where these, you know, very abrupt transitions happen. So this is basically, you know, Caney Creek is in its floodplain, but the active channel shoved all the way up against this uh, Eastern Valley wall. And it's, there's such a good forested area right along this valley wall that it's, you know, not able to really kind of erode into this valley. So kind of, you know, putting it all together, you know, what are the end goals? In terms of, this is what I normally go after in terms of, you know, doing this more for kind of a scientific reason is, you know, it's great just to document the biodiversity of the site and kind of going back to what I said about trying to find those, you know, rare soil types, um, trying to find those rare species and, you know, they might find a new, you know, range expansion in something. And I think especially as climate shifts over the next several years that it's great to see, you know, where species are now versus where they're going. And I think that a lot of times those uncommon to rare species are good indicators of, you know, kind of the um, long-term trajectory. And then in terms of um, just kind of a better understanding is that once you get an idea of these different community types, um, you can put together some really nice maps. And, you know, I think that that kind of gives an idea in terms of managing these areas, um, you know, where different habitat types are. And then once you kind of know those habitat types, and I think this is a whole different talk is you kind of get into from a from an evolutionary perspective, what were the main drivers in the system? So I think a lot of these areas around here used to historically have a lot more fire than they currently do. And I think as we want to manage more, the, the ability to try to push for maybe more fire, especially on kind of that, you know, urban interface with wildlands um, and the education process. And I think, you know, the, the bottom two is, you know, you're not going to have the ability to, you know, potentially burn within especially areas close to, you know, humans, you know, large neighborhoods and whatnot without education. And I think that, you know, the more we know about an area and, and really do a good job of giving that information to, you know, the public educators to say, well, hey, this is here now and it might have looked quite a bit differently, you know, back in the day. And we're missing out on a bunch of different species because, you know, we don't have fire, we don't have different maybe grazing mechanisms in place to promote more diversity. Uh, we should really go for that, but I think it takes it takes a lot of education of the public and then um, the, the governing body that would have to probably approve a fire, you know, next to a more urban or suburban area just because people now, for the most part, see fire and they think it's a bad thing when, you know, in all reality, it's, it's a great thing for the most part if done properly. So I think it's really to... Um, you know, give educators, you know, that, that ability to have the proof to say, well, this is, this is what maybe it is now, but maybe it used to be something different. Um, and just, 
this is a list of this is my ongoing list for the area. So I just got got the different species broken out, and I didn't do a great job of showing this. But as I collect, I try to you know note what habitat types they occur in. And that way, if, if eventually I hope to publish this data, and so kind of have an idea of you know these species occur here is you know you get a really robust you know plant list of an area and say well you know if I've got Isoedes melanopoda, black quillwort, it's a really wet species. It's a, it's actually a fern, but it looks like a sedge. It's weird. It's cool. Uh, but the, I'm only going to find that in, you know, really wet areas and flatwoods and flatwood ponds. So it kind of gives you an idea, uh, you know, more granular level of where these different plants will break out. And so the last steps, I mean, I think to date between myself, and there's been some previous research, about 450 species of plants recorded at the park. Definitely needs several more years of collecting. That seems really low for this area. And then I think taking it further, I mean, definitely could do more uh, quantitative surveys out there to really kind of get a better idea of true species composition within the community types. And we've already talked about this is using, you know, GIS models to find, to, you know, really make really nice production style maps that, you know, present really well both from a scientific perspective and from an educator's perspective of, you know, just citizens going out to the park. Um, and then I think it's great for to provide that data to, you know, City of Houston staff to utilize uh, in the presentation and ultimately in their management plans to, you know, really, you know, hopefully making biodiversity uh, something that's important for um, the management of the city's resources, the state of Texas's resources. So at this point, I will take any questions. How about this? I'll start with the chat and then people can ask questions. What would you be looking at? Not quite sure, Don, what, what would you be looking at? It's like buyouts or something. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it would. It would take a long time to get back to like, quote unquote, natural state. It'd probably be, honestly, what happened if it was soil, it'd probably be just swallowed up by invasive species like Chinese tallow and privet. That's my guess. They're just so aggressive. But yeah, at this point, I'll stop sharing and Bob can provide, well, this will be up and then I can provide Bob the slide deck in a PDF format if y'all wanna look at it more closely. Um, feel free to reach out and ask me questions if you have any after this. I can provide Bob my email address. You want to do if anyone's got questions, feel free to ask them in terms of by voice now. Uh, Andy, there's one in the chat. Uh, are there free online sources for LIDAR data? There are, um, I forget the exact website. The state has those, so there's not LIDAR coverage across the entire state, but there, there is some. Um, I don't do as much actual mapping as I used to do. So I don't have the website off my off top of my head, but yeah, you can search it for Texas and there'll be some data sets. How many plant communities have identified the site? I haven't done that analysis yet, but I'd say the very tippy top has a white oak community flowers. Probably seven or eight brought me pretty decent, demarkable ones. Cassidy, what's up? Hey, what's up? I got a question. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, I, uh, I came in a little bit late, and you'd already started with um, showing some of the aerial imagery. Where did you get that from? Earth. 
No, before that, that you layered into Google Earth. Oh, it's all, it's all Google Earth. Or Google Earth has pretty good stuff. Okay. It ha well, let me see. Like it had all the, the soil colors on it, like the red and the oh the yellow, that stuff. Yeah, and you could get the shape file and you could put it into Google Earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, so that one's actually better because that one, so that's the, the soil web, the NRCS soil okay. web. Oh, okay. That was soil, from the soil web too? Okay, cool. Yeah, but they actually have a KMZ application. Okay. So it's like, so they, you can actually download their KML and it will auto populate on your map. And then you can click on the soil type and it'll pull profiles up for you. Okay. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I thought yeah. you had said it was from UH or UT or something, but I, I just, I missed what you said. So, but it's, but it's from the soil web. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like, so like anything from NRS, like, so the soil web, the National Hydrologic Data Set, FEMA floodplains, the National Well and Inventory, all those that are, you know, federally funded type data sources have normally really good extension files into Google Earth. Cool. And stuff like the topo, like some of the stuff like the topo view, which is a US, USGS one. It, it doesn't really bring in very, you can't really pull that one into Google Earth, but you can go on their web viewer, which is through Esri or software. It's, it's good. It's just harder to like interface them in terms of final maps. If you don't have like ArcGIS, can you use that one just online from their site? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I found like so one like I don't use the floodplains all that much, but like the floodplain ones, it's laggy on Google Earth. I feel like, but it's pretty good on their web web application. Okay, cool, awesome, thanks. See, that's yeah. an easy question. I can think of some hard ones. When am I gonna come back to Rice and help you out some more? I know. Um, you know what I'm angling for, right? <laughs> <laughs> seepages yeah i mean it's just there's not great forest seeps out there it's a little bit not enough topography but it's okay uh but there's not stuff like you would get further into east texas like you know started like tyler hardin county well, i guess even north of there like on the bentley and all those more dissected formations but it just stays a little bit wetter longer can you provide impact with a resource for this yeah, I, I cut that out of there. I can provide kind of an overview. Yeah, sure. Maybe, maybe you can add that to the slide deck and- Yeah, yeah I, can put, I can put some at the end of there, just kind of like, I can do a quick research. I can do a quick little thing, pull all the different websites to get these things from. So I'm sorry, we didn't really focus that much on prairies, but prairies are part of the, the vegetation, so. <laughs> but I had this prepared. So it was actually supposed to be presented in April last year, and then that didn't happen. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm good not talking anymore. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thanks so much, Andy. Uh, Wally had to leave for the uh, Cactus Society uh, where he's past president, so that's why he introduced you, but he's not here to, uh, to close the meeting. But that's thanks fine. so much. This was hugely interesting. Thanks, Good. Andy. And Good to see you. we appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Cassie, I'll text you after this. I got something to tell you. Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> All right, see ya. All right, bye. And, okay, and thanks for all the, you know, that you're gonna send us, send me the slide deck and, and work on the resources. Sorry for yeah. the extra work. Oh, that's fine. All right, see y'all.